your blood and that order comes down to just your your blood because it's just environmental artist but just as an insight what that is what your previous career was just the general stuff it's nothing about book book nothing about um the the stuff that nintendo and the stuff to to avoid you getting in trouble plus even this interviews that we've had we we just took the claim we didn't ask anything based on the projects that we get in trouble or anything like that so Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna share this on Twitter. I don't know if they're there. Yo, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for jumping in and um, joining us live on the PNX podcast. We've got our co-host, Inked El Chapo, and we've got the man, the myth, the legend, Anthony, on the other side. How are we doing, boys? Hello. Pretty good. How's it going? <laughs> It's it's solid, man. Solid. I, I woke up not even twenty minutes ago, so I'm solid. It's daytime over here, just about, and sunlight's on my left side. So, apologies if you know I see <laughs> sun come up on this side and left on the other side for me. But yeah. trust me, it's on, it's the same boat here at the moment. It's seven forty-one. What time is it there? One forty-one. Oh wow! Oh, wow. PM on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. D- d- don't catch me on my geography, but it was France towards the the Europe side. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, yeah, that was with John from um, Arcane on. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I um, spoke to him, and it was almost ten o'clock in the night. Gosh. I was going to say, well, I eventually might talk about it like later on during the call, but we're at uh, Airborne Studios, an art outsource studio in Berlin, Germany. And I was in Seattle at the time, and it only lasted, the contract working with him only lasted for a little bit over a month or about a month. But yeah, uh, the time zones were an issue for me. And I tried my best, but I was just glad that, you know, 
uh, this went through a one month trial with them and um, at least got credited on the game that we worked on but yeah yeah that's good yeah that's, yeah, yeah. As, as long as you as long as you just get up and then see your the game that you've worked on onto the screen like and mm-hmm. you see your mention on it that's 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 um that's that's exactly what it, yeah. it was nice of them and uh, we tried Oh yeah, uh, I'm trying to think right now. Like I even, okay, I'll I'll see if I can trim it down. But if not, uh, kind of curious how long it'll take for me to introduce myself. This is almost like me having a uh, in a job interview, having a job interview. That's fine. Um, uh, so I started around 2008, way back 2008. I want to say 2008, 2009 because. Around 08, I just did focus testing, and I was in college at the time, and that's like play testing out of the blow with uh, uh, Midway. I don't know if that might ring a bell this generation, but uh, Midway Games or Midway Home Entertainment in San Diego, that's like two hours or around two hours from LA, like south of LA. But um, yeah, I just did play testing with them for a little bit around 2008, and when I graduated in 2009, um, with a degree in like 3D media arts or 3D animation. Um, I had one internship that was more just for textures or small flash game. And then another internship around the summertime of 2009 uh, at Sony in San Diego. They mostly work on the MLB games, uh, the show, MLB the show. It's still going on even until now. Um, wow. Kind of a segue. With that area, uh, they also have a different department called visual arts or creative visual arts. Um, uh, they do support work on other PlayStation games, but they're in the same area. But for me, that was in two thousand eight, oh, no, two thousand nine, and then, um, gosh, this will take me a bit to uh, explain take my. Take all your uh, time, brother. Take it, all your time. The start of my career was just a bit of like a roller coaster ride, going from. Uh, testing internships, and then uh, I worked in film VFX. I did game testing at Sony after my internships, but um, not long after that, did compositing. Worked in VFX at a uh, studio, a VFX studio in the same area in San Diego or north of San Diego. Um, that does uh, well. They're not around anymore. Uh, stereoscopic 3D conversion. So when Avatar, the first movie, came out. There is the other option to wear 3D glasses and to watch the movie in 3D. I think a few movies still do the same uh, right now, but back then in 2010, during that time, it was popular. It was that uh, trend, maybe, in the VFX industry just boomed. Yeah. So many other VFX studios started having departments um, doing just that, like converting movies to stereoscopic 3D. And um, it was pretty competitive just for other studios to do that. and. Um, they brought on so many artists at the time, so I did that for almost about four years, about three and a half, uh, but always wanted to get back in games and wanted to do something other than game testing and uh, environment art was that one route that I always wanted to dive into, and this was like 10 years ago. Um, it felt like a, a bit of a goal for me to try and aim for that job title, and looking back now, it's, it's such a different perspective just thinking about it from what's going on now and back then with me really wanting to become an, uh, an environment artist. But yeah, uh, I left that industry around early 2014 and it took me quite a, quite a bit to, you know, update my portfolio and uh, eventually got my way to become an environment artist. And um, I'm missing a, a job real quick. Sorry, I worked on military, military training simulations in between that time, so around 2014, 2015, wow. government contractor, uh, yeah, over in the Midwest near Chicago, that same state, Illinois, um, Urbana, Champaign. Um, I guess a good another good way to put it would be where uh, Volition used to be located in that area. Uh, Saints Row team, but 
the company that I worked for, uh, they had a gaming department, but just on military training simulation. So uh, the art side of things, as far as like the workload and what we do, it's kind of game art related, but the projects weren't. Related. So I uh, did that for about a year and yeah, it just felt like, you know, one job after another and things slowly started picking up after that. So kind of the same thing, went from one contract to another, did some freelance work. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember Lawbreakers uh, from Boss Key. Cool. FPS game that was on the PS4, I think, and PC. Gosh, I made only one asset on that game, but I want to say that that saved my life. <laughs> Literally, uh, the transition, and I updated my portfolio and made a few environments. So one comes to mind was a uh, Rainbow Six Siege uh, map or level, uh, like a fan art level that I uh, worked on for a few months. I don't exactly remember how long, but um, I had a few other pieces in of my portfolio that were stylized and a few that I was trying to aim for realism. But luckily from there, uh, after working with Bosky just on one asset, contract only lasted for like 10 days or just under about two weeks. But it was pretty competitive and it was kind of a, a pretty rough uh, way to go to try and get back in games because that was around the time UE4 popped up and TBR was becoming an industry standard and um, it felt like a very hard transition, not just for me, but for game artists from back in the early days, like 2000s and maybe early 2010s, but to go from the workflow making games back then to now. Um, yeah. I mean, it's been a few years for me doing this, so uh, kind of already, um, I guess, familiar with it, but yeah, kind of steering back to just working on Lawbreakers, I ended up uh, working on a few other contracts and Desert Bus VR with Gearbox uh, came to mind or comes to mind. I'm rambling, sorry. I'm trying to like... No, I'm just thinking... But I'm, just... I'm back to my, my yeah. life, literally like what what was going on back then, but uh, a small indie team in Austin, Texas called uh, Dinosaur Games. I think they're still around, but they worked with Gearbox uh, a bit on that game, the VR game. It's still on Steam. It's free. You can play it in VR and non-VR, but I uh, made a few assets on that project. And uh, right before I signed the contract to work on that project, I got an offer to work on Bloodlines 2, that vampire game that um, I most likely will talk more about it later on during this call. But yeah, things shifted from there to go from a VR game to that. And uh, that was around 2017 to 2019. I worked on a few like small projects, indie games in between, but I, I literally like pre-COVID, it was just crazy how much has changed from, sorry, this wasn't even much of an introduction. I'm gonna try and <laughs> fast forward pre-COVID to now. Uh, worked on a few other projects. So Crash Bandicoot 4 was the one with Airborne Studios. Uh, Pro Skater at the Vicarious Visions. Uh, they're now Blizzard Albany, the studio over there in New York. Um, and then Metroid Prime Remastered with a company after a studio down in Florida. So it, it was in, intended for me to do that. Like I, I when I was in New York uh, at the time, I'd never been to Florida. And this was before COVID hit. I wanted to check out Florida and see what it was like. So um, around mid 2020, I got a chance to work with a company down over there in Orlando, near Disney World. Um, didn't get a chance to go to Disney World, but well, oh, really, but yeah, we are there and um, kind of an odd topic. Uh, WWE, the NXT Performance Center was nearby there. You guys ever watch like pro wrestling, but oh, right, right. literally like full sale, they had, unless it's changed, I'm sure it did. This was like 2021. Um, yeah, it probably has changed. Uh, yeah, worked with them on that game. And then, uh, yeah, I think ever since the pandemic hit, 
was working remotely with that company and with where I am right now with an exile. So uh, I was in the Seattle area or like Bellevue or in Washington still. Um, I moved around New York, moved back, uh, trying to condense what I'm yeah. thinking in my head right now. But um, uh, like in my mind, or at least like the thought process I had when I was transitioning from compositing or trying to get back in games as an environment artist, um, I was looking into Seattle. I wanted to try something new. And after Bloodlines 2, um, yeah, when that happened, uh, so many things just shifted for me working for a company down over there to wherever was available, like what whichever studio was working or whichever company was available at the time. So um, yeah, I went from that to going to New York and moved back to Washington and then moved to Orlando, Florida, just for a bit, like for a few months to try to experience the lifestyle there. I just wanted to be there and uh, see what it was like. And then moved back to Washington, like the North, Pacific Northwest, near Vancouver, Portland, Northwest of the US. Um, and it, I don't want to say it was more of a realization, but uh, after working on that project, uh, Metroid Prime Remastered, I wanted to try something different, but something kind of in the same genre with what happened with Bloodlines 2. Um, so I, I'm kind of glad now I've been at an exile for about two years now, uh, working on a, an FPS RPG. Game got announced, Clockwork Revolution. And yeah, I, I'm here for a good reason because um, I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but yeah, with what happened with Bloodlines 2, I'm just glad that it's back. Um, it's under a different studio. Uh, last time I remember looking, they kept some of the art and level design from the previous project, well, previous Bloodlines 2 project, but um, at the end of the day, it's going to be under a different studio. And mm -hmm. um, it'll be a lot easier for me when, when it comes to Clockwork Revolution in the future. Um, to maybe talk more about it, but yeah, my environment art route, uh, not really much of a roller coaster ride compared to me trying to become an environment artist. So, it's been a long time coming. Thanks. Uh, oh man, sorry to cut you off real quick. Um, there's a typo on my last name on the uh, Metroid Prime Remastered. It's spelled almost the same way you pronounce it. So my last name is like Castellano, Castellano, Castellano. Uh, but there's an e in the game. So, so the, uh, it, but close enough. So the L on the on the last name is that silent or is that completely a typo? Uh, you know how there's double L A and O. I see it more as Spain, Spanish, oh, okay. Spanish in general. Ah, oh, okay, so like Castiano. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Filipino American, awesome. but I say American just because I grew up around here. But uh, my last name definitely has like a bit of a Spain Spanish kind of sound to it. Um, but yeah, to add on to your your thing, bro, you know how you have that friend that say that you ask him what jobs have you done, and they literally many done everything. You're you're that friend of ours. Yeah, man. Like you went from doing movies to doing games. Like, mate, you have a resume. Oh my gosh! Well, thanks. It's just uh, it, it's a little easier for me to. Well, my last it had to be with Enixel. Me talking about what I've done in the past it was a lot easier a while ago compared to ten yeah. years ago. Me trying to transition to doing all that stuff, it just sounded like I'm fumbling around trying to explain what I wanted to do back then and like game testing, compositing, and I've 
had that experience before at GDC in San Francisco, where uh, kind of funny experience, you know, at a, an after party with a few other college graduates. And, you know, I already graduated like a few years after and just chatted with a few younger folks. And they were asking me what I do and saying stereo compositor uh, kind of confused them because I don't think anybody outside of the VFX industry would really know what that was. Sounds like I composite stereos or handle something <laughs> stereo related. Um, I, I do vaguely remember my resume. I, I had my job table title switched to uh, stereo compositor to stereoscopic compositing artist, just to kind of give a better idea that it was art related. And there are some titles, like I did wonder back then if that was the issue, like compositor and compositing artists, you know how there are lighting and compositing artists jobs or job titles. Um, I wondered if that was an issue, but yeah, like back then, oh my gosh. <laughs> Testing yeah. military stuff and then slowly picking myself back up, but uh, I think that took me like 20 minutes to explain <laughs> my introduction. <laughs> so, t tell us, tell us what, what's, so when you when you first got into the whole environment like environmental artists like tell us exactly what that is and how long did it like take you to study that oh i'm gonna try and word it out in a different way but just think of like interior design and exterior design and architecture um probably the best way to put it and then wall building almost like legos building whichever building or landscape, terrain, uh, depending on the job or field. Uh, the stuff I do revolves around that in general, not even uh, my current job or studio, but even back then uh, in general, like for environment artists, they handle, sometimes they'll handle props too, like create assets. Uh, it can be a table or small prop um, or materials. Um, so I need to make sure that uh, there are a few game art terms that I guess for some game artists or developers will kind of quickly know, but just think of like fabric or material of a certain object, like wood, metal, uh, cloth. Uh, some art roles are a bit more specialized now, not just on that, but even for characters, even hair, hair artists, or I guess that would be one. Uh, vegetation, materials, props, and then there's also world building and then there's like level design and that'll kind of more toward uh, the design side. Uh, some studios will have different design departments, you know, like quest design or narrative. Um, and then for artists, depending on the project, VFX, shader, materials, um, almost everything on the back end than on the front end, if that makes yeah. sense. I'm going to try and relate that to my experience on Tony Hawk and, well, yeah, it would have to be literally just Tony Hawk. <laughs> yeah, but like, I'm looking at all of the products that I worked on and I'm like, oh no, I, I can't really talk about that one. I mean, under a different <laughs> studio now. This one can't really, and this one we just announced, but Tony Hawk, that's probably the best one because we're basing off the uh, level design from the original game. Are we based off? The gameplay of all of the levels but we had to update a few things uh, the level design team uh, polished and refined a few areas because if you were to look at the old playstation n64 tony hawk game they were so blocky way too blocky that it wouldn't fit in this modern era of remakes and remasters um depending on what it is i, I might actually take that back only on one game because that same studio by curious visions they also remastered Diablo 2 Resurrected, um, for the most part. Oh, it was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, 
one side of me wished I worked on that game or got a chance to mm-hmm. when I was there, but I wasn't really into Diablo at the time. And this was in 2019 when I was at the office there. Uh, there was, you know, one team that was mainly focused. Oh, okay. Trying to keyword it, but um, primarily just focused on Diablo 2 Resurrected. A uh, large team that just worked on that with Blizzard. And I was with the other team that was on Tony Hawk Pro Skater uh, 1 and 2. And I'm trying to remember, uh, not sure if I can bring that up, but um, at the time, mainly just two teams working on two remasters. And uh, if you ever were to play uh, Diablo 2 Resurrected, you can actually switch uh, the game to be, uh, or at least the visuals in the game to the old school one. And you can switch it back. Yeah. I never knew that. <laughs> Three years ago, yeah. Uh, yeah, I missed out on the, uh, I call it the Blizzard bandwagon because my contract, they're, they're an Activision studio and now they're an Xbox studio, but my contract ended in October 2020 and it was on a Friday and I just remember packing and uh, flying back to uh, Washington to set up my PC to work on the other game with the Outsource Studio in yeah. Florida. Um, but uh, yeah, not long after that, they became a uh, Blizzard studio. It was official, like in early 2021, that they were under Blizzard. And then I forget exactly what happened, but they ended up becoming Blizzard Albany instead of Vicarious Visions and Blizzard Studio. Uh, and I think it's the same. Yeah. Yeah, it was kind of, I'm sure internally it was kind of a, a bit of a blow, like it's upsetting to see that, but I'm glad too that they're still around. Um, yeah. I didn't I, even I know that, that, bro. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, it was kind of funny though, like thinking back just maybe a few months ago, recruiter reached out to me um, uh, for a project that was stylized and probably got mixed up because the company, they're technically Blizzard, or I honestly don't even know how I'm going to actually explain this. It might be pretty straightforward to be honest, but um, I always have to tell whoever I'm talking to about that studio that um, I didn't work at Blizzard, but they became a Blizzard studio. So I'm yeah. sure like whichever recruiter that would reach out probably just assumed that I worked on something stylized there, which I didn't. And it was Tony Hawk. And um, yeah, I had to let them know, but wasn't really interested because it was kind of a, a random thing. I, I was, was just mainly assuming because, you know, on not really on paper, but you know, they're now Blizzard. So yeah. I just I'll let you guys know I, I I was actually a massive fan of the Tony Hawk games from from in general until I switched to Xbox and I never played it again. <laughs> yeah, like I played all of them until I made that switch and I haven't got the chance to play it again. But if it's um if I if I do find it today at the shops, I'll probably buy it. Wh- which one did you work on? Then I can specifically buy that one. One and two, one plus two. Yeah, sweet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna have to look at those ones instead. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks. I don't think those made the cut. They didn't make it through, <laughs> which is fine. But uh, yeah, I have a little interesting story about that because with the company in Berlin, Germany, it was on Crash Bandicoot 4. And uh, when I joined Vicarious Visions, I didn't know it was Tony Hawk. At the time, I thought it was going to be Crash Bandicoot 4. I thought I was going to work on the same game. And when I was there on site, um, yeah, it was this game, the Pro Skater game. And uh, around late 2020, when the game came out, we got a chance to work on Call of Duty uh, Warzone. Um, it was fun, but I'm sure internally there was so much stuff that was going on. Um, I guess it's out in the public too, like Toys for Bob. Uh, well, they're not under Activision or Xbox anymore, but at the time, uh, they switched from Crash Bandicoot 4 to Warzone. Like, they got um, not a chance to work on Warzone, but they ended up working on that for a while, and then Crash Team Rumble. Um, yeah, and well, I wasn't there at the time when that happened, but yeah, they became a Blizzard studio, so um, like around 2020, literally every Activision studio worked on a Call of Duty game. Yeah. So, well, I mean. As fans, as gamers, sure. Like, I honestly don't even know what's going on over there, too. It happened so fast that I guess good for them to do what they want yeah. to do. Yeah. Spyro, Spyro the Dragon Force. I like that. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, the fan and, in uh, me wants to speculate, too. But, yeah. like, he actually did the uh, Spyro trilogy and. Uh, my character's vision is the uh, uh, Crash Bandicoot trilogy, and I think Toys R Us worked with them too. And then Beanox, not too far, they're in Quebec City, near Montreal, like three hours to Montreal. They made the uh, racing game, Crash Team Racing Nitro. Oh, another game that I actually liked when I was thinking growing up. Oh, bro, you, you know what? You're there is like a good, me. yeah. Activision was going through that phase of like remasters, and I think they're still doing it, but. That was kind of fun at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, we spoke about what Spyro the Dragon, it's something that I'm looking for. If it does, if it is potentially a thing, that's 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 the game in us talking anyways, but yeah, Spyro the Dragon, or even if it's something regarding Crash, bro, <laughs> I'm all in. I'm all in. Oh, I'm such a uh, Nintendo fan that throws Crash Bandicoot. Well, it could be. I'll check <laughs> out. <laughs> but yeah, um, outside of your environmental uh, artist history that we have there, you you also mentioned that you worked on movies as well. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, I need to sugarcoat it. It was fun, but man, it, yeah. was, it was grueling at the time. But yeah, like, I think that was around the time where I knew what I really wanted to do. Um, I got into that just because it was available and I was looking into art jobs at the time and wasn't willing to move outside of the city. Uh, LA wasn't that far, but for me, I just wanted to stay near, I guess, where I grew up. Um, moved a bit north of San Diego, not too far, like literally just a few, uh, less than an hour, an hour away from LA. So could have easily done it a different way, but uh, mm -hmm. Carlsbad, Dilmar, that's like in the northern side. Rockstar Games, we actually were uh, at the same office. So this was around no 2013, way. 2014. It was kind of cool. No so the, the VFX studio, they relocated from Dilmar um, 
trying to remember exactly where, but a few miles north of Sony San Diego. And when we relocated to Carlsbad, we were in the same building as Rockstar Games, just a block away from Highland Studios, another Activision studio. Uh, I actually had a job interview there, like on one day that, uh, I don't know if you remember the Deadpool game, 2013. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. It was such an interesting job interview because I do remember one of the developers had like a fake gun in the couch and I was like nervous. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't get the job. And the other issue I had at the time, on the flip side, it was kind of cool to see all of the movies that most of us, uh, they hired so many artists, so many graduates at the time. The, the office was packed with about like, I want to say a hundred artists and like producers and anything revolving around you know production, almost the same as games, but a bit more fast paced. Yeah. Because, you know, movies can take nine months or a bit longer or some, depending on the uh, post-production, how fast they want, uh, I guess their deliveries, like three months, six months or nine. Um, I don't exactly remember which project, but I do vaguely remember the hours would start with, uh, it'll go from eight hours a day, a 40 hour work week to like 50. And in some cases, and it always happens like 60. So crunch will always kick in like halfway or near the end of the uh, the project. Um, uh, I had a few other chances, a few other interviews with other yeah. studios. I knew I wanted to become an environment artist and I wanted to switch, but uh, the other issue I had was mainly just time to work on my portfolio and the transition because that was the other thing too, not just the job title and getting paid, doing stuff that's like, please is doable and can enjoy when, you know, when a movie comes out, you can watch it. And that part wasn't really the issue. It's just, um, it really shows as the years went on, you know, not just for me, but for other folks there that, um, <laughs> I don't want to say it was dreadful, but uh, it, maybe it was like a quarter quarter life crisis where it, it was either now or never for me to yeah. do something different and make that decision right away. So before my fourth anniversary, uh, I just quit and I did pretty like not I didn't end it on a bad note. Um, I don't know if you guys remember uh, Spider Man Two with Andrew Garfield. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wish it was, you know, Tom Holland, but it was okay. I'm just glad to see that he came back for No Way Home or that one movie. Yeah. All three of them. But yeah, 2014, early 24. Yeah, sorry. Um, I remember giving them my two week notice that ended up becoming a month because they just wanted to make sure the workload was pretty steady. And I didn't want to just leave right away. Uh, well, no, I, I didn't want to leave literally on that day. Of, so I was okay with two weeks and a month. Um, we just settled on that. Uh, they wanted to at least extend it. Um, sorry, I'm trying to think back. It was a very interesting uh, uh, experience, like agreeing to one month and then uh, the producer there wanting me to stick around for a bit longer, but my mind was already set uh, on a certain date. So when that happened, uh, I tried not to look back and it was a, a bit of a journey to leave that yeah. industry and to really go for what I really wanted to do. Um, yeah, it's been like 10 years. Um, wow. Uh, but yeah, if you were to look at a few other VFX artists um, or just other or compositors or anybody that's in that industry, uh, you'll check out their IMDb. They have like 100 movies or 50 plus movies. Um, it goes by pretty fast. It's pretty fast paced. And I'm sure nowadays it might be even the same. Actually, to be honest, the same when it comes to like Netflix movies or TV series, TV shows, um, the business kind of shifted. Uh, thinking about it again, yeah. My route has been kind of an interesting um, thing for me to talk about just because, oh man, I'm, 
<laughs> me looking left and right is me wondering if I can talk about it or not. But yeah. like, on Bloodline 2, yeah. we wrapped up to about maybe, well, it was a pretty good number to the point where I remember almost everybody's name, at least in my department. And then for so now Pro Skater 1 and 2, um, I want to say it was like around 8. When it comes to just the environment artist, 8 or 10, we were all in just in one room um, near the level designers. And then I think what got me a bit confused was when the pandemic hit and um, it was all just remote and through video calls. But for Metroid Prime Remastered, it was fairly small, but we worked with uh, another studio. Um, I don't think I can really say much aside from that, but uh, I guess that would be a, a pretty good range and it's understandable. Um, and it's not just on that game, but depending on the team, team sizes for an external studio and working with the actual studio. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, trim it down to the point where I think that's about yeah. good enough. <laughs> Six, seven years. Mm. Yeah. The scary. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't want to say a scary reality, but. Uh, Oh, never mind. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, <laughs> relate it to like it's a small industry. Like everyone will almost pretty much, even with social media, six degrees of separation will know who's who and which studio, who works at which company, and worked on which game. And it's out of anybody's control. Well, well I can't even point fingers to be honest. Like it's out of out of people's control with what happens when it, once the game's out. Um, when you see like Metacritic's reviews or review scores, um, it's upsetting and it's kind of crazy to see uh, what get good review what get good reviews. Sorry, I'm, sometimes I talk fast depending on what I'm saying, and then what comes out of my mouth might have it a little, little bit mixed. But <laughs> when you look at games like <laughs> like uh, I had like two cups of coffee, but um, <laughs> Helldivers 2 and Pal World comes to mind, but I think for Helldivers 2, it took the studio like nine years or eight years, and wow. you compare that to a few other games that uh, a bit of a surprise, and I think it could be either the genre, and you know, when you look at eight years ago, 2016, 2017, Fortnite pretty much picked up, and I guess uh, a few studios wanted to grab that same idea, and you know, eight, nine years later, didn't really turn out the same way that they would expect. And the generation kind of shifts, or at least like trends and what's popular changes over time. Um, and I honestly don't know what. Yeah. It probably won't be that well. Well, it is. And when Apex Legend came out, became a popular game, and Warzone, yeah. when that came out, you know, right off the bat, um, there are a few other games that when that happened, like when those games came out, um, didn't really turn out the same way. Um, can't really think of much right off the top of my head right now, but uh, it is interesting, even for like single player games, multiplayer, and I'm sure you already looked up, you know, which games got canceled not too long ago. and. Last year, the layouts, 
studio closures. It's been, yeah, it's been hectic. It's been a crazy year. Um, yeah. That's a hard one for me to answer because I think for um, oh, yeah. getting no, I'm, my head's been doing the same <laughs> thing, so I've been trying to fix it. I, I, I kind of shifted a bit because sometimes it might make me look like a you know a little boy. But I don't know. It's fine. Okay, never mind. Um, it's hard to explain. I think it depends on the developer what they experience because I'm uh, probably not the best one to answer that. Like how to handle layoffs or stuff like that. Um, I moved to the area here not too long ago, like around this time last year, from Washington. Not specifically in Seattle, but in the state, and then moved down over here to be closer to work. Um, yeah, I worked at the office not too long. No, take that back, maybe sometime a few months ago. But we have folks you know, working remotely, not specifically here in the area. And we also have an office in New Orleans and the South, I think Southeast in the US. But um, yeah, when the Activision Blizzard layoffs hit, even though it didn't affect at least me, um, Felt pretty close. Even the same with Riot. And uh, yeah, in the past, like when I was at the VFX studio, I quit and gotten laid off. Government contractor, uh, they laid me off. And well, I, I know I mentioned it before uh, when I was on Bloodlines 2, I uh, got let go. And I, I guess it's different for every studio because. Um, so much can easily happen, or something can easily happen, and who knows what, like game cancellations, and like I was already gone by then when Bloodlines 2 got delayed and got shifted, but when I heard that, you know, it's now under the Chinese room, um, yeah, I'm just glad to see it come back, but that doesn't always happen. You know, it's kind of upsetting too when you spend nine or eight years on a game, and to see it get canceled, it's, it's upsetting, and I don't know I uh, don't think I've ever experienced that. I think the closest one was literally Bloodlines 2. But even even then, um, I worked on that less than two years, like in less than two years, and been at NXL for a bit over two years. So it's kind of already, um, for some reason, I'm seeing it in like the layman's terms, but I've been on this project or been at NXL longer than I have on Bloodlines 2 to the point where I, before I joined NXL, I always wondered what it was like working on a, an RPG again, but I had that fear of uh, the project, you know, spinning in a downward spiral or, mm. you know, getting canceled or going through the same thing that happened back then. And to see it happen with other studios, it was kind of scary, like kind of upsetting that um, it's different for everybody how they handle that. Because some are very attached to the project, like for me, uh, never really grew up, you know, getting into vampires or not really much into the uh, World of Darkness lore. But when it came to like game development, um, it was odd. It was interesting. Like I did environment art on that game long enough, but I guess there were things that for me, I, I don't know, everyone has their own opinion on a certain project and it's a mix of passion or what they feel is right or wrong but uh, yeah with to see what's happened now to where it, it was just a while ago felt like it was it almost reminds me of uh, the Knights of the Old Republic remake where you know it got announced and then was silent for a while and then now that saber is independent uh, I 
I'm wondering, I'm trying to remember if they publicly announced it, but I'm assuming that. It is, well, hang on, I think Aspire is still under the Embracer group. So um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I think that's so different, a little bit different than what happened with the line two, but uh, I think I just, for me, I, or at least for my case, I'm glad to at least see that there's a release date or a time frame, one that's going to come out. Um, and yeah, I, I'm been getting into level design. I mean, after working on a few projects, uh, I think it's different. I know we say that all the time, but with what happened, you know, last year and a few months ago with those massive layoffs, yeah. I don't know. I, I am kind of curious if for those that worked on it at a certain studio on I'm wording it out in a different way. Sorry if I'm fumbling with what no, I'm saying. Fine, but, um what I'm trying to get at is like if someone were to do art uh, specifically like for characters or or environment art or level design and with these layouts I'm pretty sure it might drift them into doing something else that's still game dev related or game industry related but not entirely in the same department. Um just a different role that will probably be available in the future. So crossing my fingers, hopefully those that have been affected will be able to land their feet soon. But mm. it was crazy just to see all that happen. But I, I honestly don't know like how many art roles are there now. And it all depends on the projects and studios that form up and what's gonna happen in the next coming months. You know? Yeah, like could like um it's it's a really hard topic like it's a really hard topic to talk about um the potentially like some some of the things that could attribute which you might be able to let us know as well um that could lead to developers losing their positions or games getting cancelled off is um console warring and like but then like putting in fake scorings on Metacritics or all, all those ratings, putting it at zero and saying that the game isn't that good, but it's actually like perfect. Um, that could potentially like be another factor to a day. I never really thought about that. Um, but yeah, I can see that becoming a problem. Uh, I don't know, I guess I, I've been playing Alone in the Dark. And I think that quickly yeah. comes to mind right away. And uh, I would check the uh, Metacritic score and reviews here and there. But um, one side of me is glad that it didn't go lower than like around 64, 65. Um, it's kind of like in that odd range where it's not the worst game out there, but it could have been a bit better. But I'm just glad to. Uh, to see it, that it's in a good range, and I played the game and playing it again with Edward Carnby. And not too long ago, I played the game uh, playing as uh, what's her name, Emily Hartwood. Um, it was fun. It was pretty good. Yeah, game. like it was, it was pretty good. I've um... reimagining a reboot, but where I'm getting at with that is that um, kind of the same thing with what you mentioned that it could easily be you know, user reviews, putting the uh, score lower, or not just that game, but a few other games that came out not too long ago where, of course, it's probably, I'm sure it's a good game, but uh, whichever yeah. user review or even journalist reviews, they're probably a yeah. bit, uh, bit too harsh. Maybe the reviews were a bit too harsh than they, uh, really showed it. I'm assuming that it just kind of steered more towards whoever reviewed a certain game might be more of a fan of that company or that franchise compared to like giving that same journalist or reviewer to play a different game that's totally different than what they usually play and might give it yeah. a lower review. Or and you've got like you got yeah the game the game I think I think I think some people they 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 have a specific choice of games. Like for me, 
when I saw Alone in the Dark, that's something that I probably would love because I'm in, I love I like horror type of games or story type of games. I love those, I love that type of genre. Um, but um, like going back to the whole thing, um, the it's not generally the 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 like the reviewing companies like like for example IGN that's causing the 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 stir. It's just like it's like for example if a game releases just on Xbox, you have a group of other people from different platforms jumping in saying, "Oh no, this game isn't that good. Give it a zero, whatever." And then if a game's coming out on PlayStation or on Xbox, you have the same thing going to them. So um, and it just it, and like if you if you search it up on on Google, it does drop like like the user score potentially on like on certain websites where they say that oh the game got a user score of seventy four or seventy six or seventy three, which mm. like like because we spoke to a couple of people that that rely on the Metacritic score. Um, me, I don't rely on that. I whatever game I see, if I like it, I'm getting it. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, after. like most companies, like if it's good, if the reviews are above eight, I'm sure they'll boast about it. But yeah, for user score reviews, it fluctuates. I'm sure it changes over time. Yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, outside of that, like like we said the last time, um, any developers that are going through all these issues, um, the hard times where. Our condolences and everything go out to you guys, and hopefully, throughout your journey, you guys find something that really um, sticks by you. Um, but anyways, back to back to yourself, man. Um, you said about the movies and stuff. Have you have you got the chance to meet any of the celebrities and stuff? Uh, <laughs> Zack Snyder visited uh, the studio around twenty. No, it wasn't Zack Snyder. We had a, a video call with Zack Snyder in 2013, but no, it was Michael Bay. I, oh, uh, 2011. Yeah. Um, those two names come to mind because I, I almost got it mixed up. But so around 2011, when around the time I joined, maybe around summertime, you know, it was late 2010 that I joined and around May or spring. I'm getting, I might be getting it mixed up as far as like the seasons, like around spring or summer. But I do remember Michael Bay visiting, and it was pretty crowded around that floor when he showed up, and the producers around and the executives were around him, you know, protecting him in a way, just so that you know. I'm sure most of the folks that were there on the floor, like all of the compositors and all the VFX artists, were all fans too. So, just wanted to make sure that they won't come to him. Like, picture. So, it went by pretty fast. Yeah. He was just telling everybody that we're all doing a. Great effing job. But, and, um, were they, were they surrounding him like uh, protecting the all spark from the Transformers <laughs> movie? So, well, uh, <laughs> well, for a VFX or or VFX video to see a director, you know, show up, I'm sure like you just want to make sure that you know, some random person could easily do something that might come off. Yeah, bad. yeah. Give a bad impression, I guess, to the higher ups or to the executives. So. It went by pretty fast, and I'm glad that even for us in our department, we're all pretty respectful too. And um, I think I'm probably getting it mixed up as far as like seeing Michael Bay at a comic con or at a convention event than at an office. So we were all quiet and professional too. So when he gave his his speech, gave everybody his speech, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah. And then I didn't get a chance to meet him in person. To answer your question, it went by so fast, but I did saw him uh, well in person, but didn't get get a chance to like talk to him. Um, and then around 2013, uh, we had a uh, company wide meeting, and uh, where we had a, a video call with Zack Snyder, and I don't exactly remember how long the call was, but it was on a projector screen, and I think that was it. At the time, or at that time, I was already jaded and was thinking of leaving. But it was a cool feeling to see that um, oh, well, the movie we worked on was a Man of Steel Superman movie. Yeah. 
That's yeah. the only movie that I was uh, credited on. The other one was Top Gun 3D. That was only in theaters for like a week, but it's in Blu-ray, DVD. But uh, as far as like feature film movies, when I found out that I was credited, I was already done, like mentally done. And because, uh, yeah, when I brought up most of those folks in the industry um, that have worked on several movies, not all of them get credited. And it can be a bit of a bummer, you know, you stay at one studio. And maybe the same for a game that gets canceled after eight, working on the project for eight years or who knows how long. It can take a toll. And it did for me, like after, yeah, three years or two years not getting credited and just didn't really think much of it. But mm -hmm. when that happened, uh, yeah, I was already set. Like, okay, I can, I can literally like sail off and maybe leave someday, knowing that I at least got credited on one movie out of like <laughs> the ten, twelve movies I worked on. Um, not a lot. Thinking about it again, or thinking about it again, but uh, well, within a span of three, four years, um, one was a bummer, but to work on like twelve or ten. Uh, I don't know. I guess it depends on the VFX studio too. But yeah, I, it was cool to see that. But for me, the celebrities, at the way I, uh, I think for all of us, being fans of the industry and fans of certain studios, if you were to meet a developer that works at Respawn or Insomniac or Naughty Dog, like to me, those are like the celebrities in our industry. Um, like because... seeing the, yeah. Um, like Brian Fargo, my boss. Uh, we'll probably talk or once there's, the, depending on the time, maybe in the future. Um, he's worked on several games in the past that I'm sure you two have played him way back in the day, but uh, not just him, a few other names that I can't think of right off the top of my head right now. But yeah, if you were to go to like GDC or even E3 is not around anymore. Um, yeah. kind of upsetting, but any of those gaming conventions to meet a few developers that worked on those games, like to me at the time, those are more of like the celebrities that I would freak out if I were to see them in person than like Michael Bay or I don't know which director, maybe Christopher <laughs> Nolan. I might actually get freak out a bit if I were to see them in person, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess that, to answer your question, yeah, uh, it was kind of cool to get a chance to work on those movies back in the day. But um, even while I was at this studio, I always wanted to work in games. Yeah, they, they, heard, they heard that you were trying to leave and then they roped you back in. They're like, yep, you're not going anywhere. We're going to put your name in the credits. And then you still I'm put sure. the work. Yeah, well, I can see that happening where it's not just the VFX industry or the studio, but you know, if they want to make sure somebody's comfortable, they'll try their hardest to do whatever they can. Um, but I did say after I got credit on that game, or not game, Man of Steel, uh, that movie came out around June 2013. Um, I think in my head at the time, I wanted to leave near the end of that year, but yeah. I stayed uh, much longer than intended, I guess. So uh, after that movie came out, I stayed for about like eight months after that. So, yeah, uh, for some reason I was thinking of something else, but kind of relates to what you just said. Uh, one movie. Is it, is it It's going to be a Nintendo game. I'm trying to think of a good one. The easy answer for me would be Super Mario 64, but I want to say a handful of those games on the N64, like Ocarina of Time or Smash Brothers. Um, kind of off topic or separate note, I did 
play tournament, Tides of Numenera, not too long ago. Right after I joined Enigdal, I played most of their games. So yeah, that was a pretty, pretty fun game. Um, so if you look at the history behind what they did or what they've done in the past 10 years with Wasteland 2, Tides, uh, Torment Tides of Numenera, and then Baldur's Gate 4, and then Wasteland 3, so different compared to when they started with just uh, the Bard's Tale. I think I said Baldur's Gate. I meant to say the Bard's Tale 4 game. Yeah, I'll, in, I'll get back to the N64 games in a bit, but um, that was one of the main reasons why I joined NXL, and I mean, the game's already announced, but knowing that they've worked on several RPGs in the past, uh, I at least knew ahead of time that, you know, it's their bread and butter, it's what they like doing. Um, and, of course, for RPGs compared to, like, 3D platforming games and, you know, like, sports games and wrestling games, well, racing games and wrestling games, like, those don't really take as long compared to, you know, role-playing games. So uh, I think that's about as much as I can say, but as far as the history, it's pretty strong history. And, but yeah. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I've been with the company for a little bit over two years now, but I want to say they had one writer that worked on uh, Planescape. I think I'm getting that right. Um, the RPG from late 90s. Uh, yeah, that's the other studio that Brian Fargo ran back in the day, Interplay, and then it's Black Idol for years. Uh, around the late 90s and early 2000s. But yeah, that department or that uh, sub-studio, subsidiary, uh, worked on several RPGs that ended up becoming like classic hits at the time. Um, Baldur's, well, no, no. Bioware made Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. Interplay published them. But uh, Fallout 1 and 2 they made. And then Planescape and uh, I want to say Neverwinter Nights or Icewind Dale, uh, those top-down RPGs from back in the day. Um, but yeah, I might be getting it wrong, but I, I do believe that they brought in some of the developers that worked on Planescape or a couple of those games back in the day on Torment. And the team kind of shifted from there, but uh, yeah, we're pretty tight-knit with what we're doing right now. Uh, so I, I know I uh, have a few coworkers that have been with the company for almost just as long as that game came out and even when they started. Yeah. Too good. Too good. Oh. Yeah. 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 or which studio? Yeah, Brand Excel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I I want to say we chatted about that before, but yeah, pretty well. Yeah. Uh, the, you, you guys, you so in exile, and there's another company that does it like the best. So out of all the studios I've ever seen upload stuff about their games, it's in exile and compulsion games that do it the best. I've never seen, bro. Every single time so, that someone uploads from in exile, I crack up, bro. <laughs> No, I didn't see that. Now I'm gonna see that.
Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, to kind of reel it back with like platformer games, Nintendo games, and oh, you're watching the. I need to check out uh, our later. Sometimes <laughs> when I'm too busy with work, I have to be with what. Uh, yeah, I, I had to get into it straight away, bro. As soon as you mentioned Connor and Greg playing in Exile, I had to watch it. I know. I'll check it out. I got into well, Alone in the Dark around the same time uh, Dragon's Dogma two came out, but I have a bit of a uh, small heart for. Well, I have a heart for THQ from way back in the day. Yeah. Um, just because the uh, studio that uh, I did game testing with, uh, game testing for focus testing in San Diego uh, when Midway filed for bankruptcy um, they sold that company to THQ that well that branch that office in San Diego to THQ and if you guys ever remember the WWE all-star game yeah. that was on the Wii it was from that branch that office down over there and that was the only game that they made and then I want to say they helped out on Darksiders 2 just a little bit before THQ filed for bankruptcy and then uh, Nordic Games Bought the license to a couple of those uh, THQ games. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah when you mentioned like, THQ, I was like, yeah, WWE. That that came straight yeah. to mind. <laughs> SmackDown versus Raw, and that was one of the only cartoons. Uh, no, no. I, I think uh, PS2 and yeah. yeah. Uh, Smackdown vs. Raw and all. Yeah. yeah see, I mean, I mean, as soon as you mentioned THQ, I was like, because of the Smackdown games and the Raw, like the WWE games. Sorry. Yeah, if you guys ever play um, uh, AEW. Yeah, WWE. Yeah. Yeah. Federation <laughs> Entertainment. I mean, it's still it's still entertainment, but. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they paid homage to the uh, THQ logo if you were to play uh, AEW Fight Forever. It's another wrestling promotion, but uh, THQ Nordic published that game and the start of the game. Once you launch it, it will show uh, THQ Nordic's logo and then shift to uh, the old school THQ logo. But um, it's a very interesting history because Nordic Games acquired or bought the license to so many of those games from THQ. And ended up rebranding the company with THQ Nordic. And then after they acquired several other studios, they changed their whole company to Embracer Group or to the Embracer Group to what it is right now. And then THQ Nordic became a subsidiary. So um, that's probably the only other publisher or only publisher that it comes to a third party or on that side that I uh, often follow depending on the games that they're uh, making or publishing. So when Alone in the Dark came out, um, just slowly became a fan of that series or that game. So I don't know if I'll play the old school PC games or Alone in the Dark PC games, but um, just I enjoyed the game for what it was. And I'm, of course, Dragon's Dogma 2 is a good game from what I've heard. And uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Yeah, you have a you have a meeting with that group, the game. Honey, honey, from this time and this time, I'm in the meeting. I won't be able to see you. <laughs> you guys, you guys often play like several games at the same time, or just one specific game. It's hard enough, you know, if you have other games that are on your catalog or backlog.
Yeah. Oh, true. Mm -hmm. You'd have to wait a few months for another. Thing. Yeah. And my 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 OCD kicks in really bad when it comes to oh. my backlog. At first, I had about I think fifteen games that I had to try and um, get over, and and my OCD kicked in like a horse. And this year alone, I already finished I think five games so far. That's a start. Yeah. yeah. Probably better than I've done it in the past too, and I, I I'm at fault for doing it. But you know, you play one level or an hour or a few minutes on one game, and then you try and play other games, but end up getting lost in the shuffle. A new game comes out, and then you just get obsessed. Or for my case, like I know I played a few other games in between Baldur's Gate three and Alan Wake two, but after the first chapter of Alan Wake two, I don't know if you two ever played that game. Um, of all things, when the end of that chapter ended, uh, Fall You Into the Dark, that song played, it just gave a different tone. And even though it's like a survival horror game, but it got me pretty hooked, wondering what was going to happen after that chapter and ended up getting into that. And well, holidays kicked in and a few other stuff. But yeah, I know what you mean. I have so many other games on my catalog. And, like I wanted to specific little. I have like a small list when it comes to this year, just alone in the dark and maybe uh, well a few other that I saw in the future class, you know, future game show. Um, the future classes from the game awards, but um, uh, Bloodlines too. I want to say it's going to come out later this year. So and so on. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad. Well, a ton of the Chinese room they'll show more when the time comes and when the yeah. trailer is re uh, resurfaced or surfaced, it's just a good feeling to see that come back. But um, yeah. Same here. Same here. I'm, I was I never got a chance to play the first one. I did uh, on the second one. I have it on my Xbox, but it's kind of cool to see that come back. And I was also nominated for several awards. So, uh, crossing my fingers for the Chinese room. I mean, it's their game. I, that's pretty much what else I could say. I don't know. I mean, but as far as the release, I'm just glad to see that you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the way I saw it and the way that it actually it was a, actually got got a question that I I I asked I, I asked uh, Jean this last week or the week before that uh, last week um, because you guys develop games and stuff and you you mentioned to me earlier that uh, two hours before before I I woke up that you were playing games um, <laughs> um, does does it change the fact that you like see games now? Do you continue to enjoy playing games, or do you like see it as oh, I'm back at work because I'm playing a game? I guess it depends on the game. Yeah, uh, I don't. I need to try and rephrase that or not say depends all the time. But uh, with what we're working on, that's what I signed up for. And yeah. Like after Metroid Prime remastered and Tony Hawk and a few other games, uh, it felt like it was becoming more of like another well-known franchise, a popular franchise or something that the general audience is familiar with. So to switch to this where it's something new and especially under NXL where um, even when Wasteland 3 came out and you know, they've been under Xbox for several years, uh, this reminds me of like the Outer Worlds from Obsidian. And I'm sure there's another game that comes to mind that I can't really think of at the moment. But I uh, guess I'll have to wait and see. I'm, I mean, I'm sure everybody else will. But it's so different coming from Enigdal after Wasteland 3 and several of these other games that were more 
like a top-down strategy game or a uh, role-playing game. But uh, I guess for me, it's, my answer would probably be different if I were to work at Activision still on a Call of Duty game and to just come home and play Call of Duty again. I'm sure yeah. my answer would be different. But uh, the games that I'm playing, I mean, I, I change it or I, I frequently play different types of games for a good reason to maybe pick up something that uh, I don't often see on not even like the stuff I do at work, but uh, even like the level design stuff that I posted not too long ago. I really wanted to do that just to see what it was like. And uh, I want to say it was because of games like Alan Wake 2, of all things, and that's more of like a third person survival horror. But uh, without saying much, even me, I'd like the team at Excel. Like, the, uh, there's so much I can say, but without really saying much, like, depending on the department, um, some of the folks that I met and games like Alan Wake 2 uh, and me playing Perfect Dark again on Game Pass led me to wanting to just create. Yeah, it's just a video. Uh, I don't think I'm going to push it that far to just have a playable level for people to play it. This was just uh, me wanting to experiment and try something different. Um, I can really... Sure. Um, yeah, it doesn't have any music playing, but uh, it's kind of a thing, a random thing for me to bring up because uh, <laughs> I never really brought it up before. But like first year when I joined Enixal, I uh, used to go to the gym and would listen to music from Goldeneye and Perfect Dark and no way, kind of, kind of nerdy, <laughs> even like Metroid, uh, some of the tracks from a couple of the Metroid games, but like old school retro. Uh, video game music and first time using it, you know, it can it's really yeah. relaxing listening to mm -hmm. I, I feel guilty to that. I mean when Plague Tale 2 came out, bro, countless times I've had the the soundtrack for Plague Tale 2 playing in the background while at the gym. Plague Tale 2? Yeah. As a Plague Tale so Plague Tale Requiem, sorry. Yeah. The music was that good? It's so good. Um, uh, uh, you might in your in your time to search up. Um, uh, I'll tell you the names, and trust me, these two have been stuck in my head ever since. Every single time I go to the gym, I play this in the background. Whoa! Uh, it's called, and and it's legitimately a hype song. So it's um, like epic music. Yeah, it's like uh, so. Whoa. The first song they call it "Watch Me Burn." Whoa. And the second one is um it's a it's a violin it's a violin um instrumental but it's not it sounds also good. I know that have game. You, uh, have you played it? Have you played it? I don't think so. I, I, oh I man, if you if you walk if you like um if you like uh, story games like Alan Wake and stuff. You're gonna definitely enjoy that. Definitely, uh, that game has. Um, I'm not gonna spoil it for you in case you do want to go for it. It's on. It's on Game Pass, anyways. Um, I was actually when I first started playing it, I was okay. I was like, I was like, just trying to find a new title to play, and that game has slowly became my favorite game of all time. That's kind of cool to hear. I'm the same with Alan Wake 2 and uh, a few games where it takes time. To kind of let it sink in and for yeah. you to get familiar with you know the characters and the backstory the premise of the game um for some games it didn't really matter like for alone in the dark i knew for sure that i was going to enjoy it but uh, i guess Baldur's gate 3 would be a good example too uh, i played the first two just because wanted to try it out and knowing that the third one was going to come out um but 
yeah, it didn't really take that long. The combat was pretty fun, and the voice acting was pretty good. Um, that's probably not a good example but now that I think about it, because of course, like maybe a good hour or thirty minutes. I don't know about you guys, but I was already hooked. Got interested in that yeah. game. Yeah, some certain games do that. Eh? Certain games do that a lot. Like I, I bought, I bought just to prepare myself for Alan Wake and Alan Wake Two. I bought Control, so I'm playing that at the moment before I jump into Three. Yeah, oh, that's a whole different game, though. Well, I mean, it's part of the uh, nowadays. They help it's the same right. universe, yeah. No. Yeah, I don't know if I can see. Oh. Um, let me see. On well, I have the video. Oh, sure. Yeah. So going down the vents, it's literally like, you know, Goldeneye. Just think of. Oh, that's my voice. It's kind of weird just hearing my own voice. Okay. Yeah. No, it's fine. I uh, just put it on mute, just uh, to have. Yeah. Um. The thought process. I, saw, I, I made it. Oh good. I saw your loadout and saying, you know how you have your the, the video. I saw the loadout. That it <laughs> reminds me of um Apex Legends. Oh yeah, I actually got into that game too. Yeah. Yeah. When that came out, I mean, it's still a fun game. Right away, same with uh, Rainbow Six Siege and yeah, Call of Duty Warzone. Um, that was from a, a plugin from the Unreal Marketplace that I grabbed. Uh, the two main features that I wanted was just to uh, vault and I think crawl. A few other features are uh, not really gameplay aspects, but just things that weren't in the default Unreal um, plugin. Or Yeah, but still Unreal Engine 5, uh, fairly straightforward. I mean, this could easily be done in Unreal Engine 4 with BSPs, brushes, or just cubes. But near the end when I was, I guess technically I'm done with this, um, I converted them to uh, nanite meshes, and I think that's like the new feature for Unreal Engine 5 where you can have as many uh, polygons and geometry on the screen. But once you switch it to nanite, it, it'll still run just as smooth. They were just a few assets. So this will feel more like a GoldenEye and 64 ish type level. Um, so what I was trying to pull or to portray or to introduce in a way, uh, seeing enemies okay. from a few a floor above and a few floors below. How, how long did it, like the, the video, how long did it take you to make that video? Oh. I mean, yeah, like the animation, yeah. Uh, for this one, I did use OBS. I think you guys are also using that right now. Um, yeah, that's that was just a quick playthrough of me running around for a bit under ten yeah. minutes. But as far as like building the whole thing, it took me a few months. I want to say before the holiday break, um, maybe three altogether, three months uh, in between my free time and playing a few games, but. Um, I have my original sketch in my Tumblr, like a small blog that I barely use, but ended up using that for this case. Um, yeah. It was all just in a building, like in one building, just going from, it reminds me of, not really like Mortal Kombat, but the uh, Raid movie in, in Indonesia or in Thailand, but like a martial arts movie, almost like Raid. But like over here, I, I ended up just drifting not sure. Uh, drifting away from my original idea and then going downstairs into like a, an underground facility. And if I were to show, I, I have it posted on my ex at Twitter, but it, it just went into a whole different direction where I wanted to add more space. And there was no way I could have done that 
without having to just shift it into a different direction and not everything confined to just the, the width and length of that facility or that original building. So instead of going downstairs all the time and then going through from room to room, um, I have the uh, walkthrough or the player going down uh, underground and then would also have more room to just add, uh, I guess, more walls, taller walls, a wall height, more space around there. Um, could have easily done that with the uh, facility building that I made originally, but uh, it felt natural. It just felt like it fit with the perfect dark feel and golden eye feel where either this could have been like a different level or in the same level, but even for a game like in the 90s, uh, was it all just linear, like 90 degrees everywhere? Um, some walls are angled, like the way I have it underground. I have a few angled walls and a few that are like 90 degree angles, but um, kind of fun to do it that way instead of just having it all in one building going downstairs all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Where to start first? Yeah. Oh gosh, uh, it is. Well, I have it on my Tumblr, like me playing through the same room all the time, like iterations, just making sure that it feels right. I'm sure level designers do the exact same thing. And me being an environment artist, we just handle the art side of things. And with whatever lockout is already set for us to add art on top of that, literally like the Tony Hawk Pro Skater games, but um, here I'll. Thanks for the uh, video. I'm watching myself. <laughs> um, Sitting there thinking, well, who's this environmental artist that I'm watching? Oh, wait, it's myself. I, I, I might end up criticizing myself too, like the way I sound, because I uh, I don't think I cursed yet. Sometimes I'll curse. If I step on Legos or on a nail, I'll slur, but kind of filtered right now. For some reason, I have like the library tone. I'm giving you yeah. a voice right now, but, um, it, as far as, if, oh, go ahead. No, no, continue, continue, sorry, man. Uh, like, this is stuff that is outside of what I'm familiar with when it comes to what I really wanted to do, like, a few years ago, wanting to become an environment artist that just handles mostly just the art side of things. Um, and to translate that, like, interior design, architecture, exterior, anything related to buildings or in a modular way, like the walls and the stairs to just model that in. And not really focus on the player experience. I think that's something that, no, no, no. Like that's literally something that I wanted to make myself after playing games like Alan Wake 2 and I'm sure a few other games like Perfect Dark, of course, but um, the experience was what uh, I took away from that. And I don't really play that many survival horror games. Haven't really played uh, any of the recent Resident Evil games, but um, like when, if you were to watch the video again, just that feeling of going down the vents. And uh, for me, I would play them on uh, the Xbox controller, or PC contro not PC controller, but I have an Xbox controller attached to my PC. And when you play an FPS on a controller, um, it's a little different, but just thinking about it again like having to turn left and right or to, to have your joystick both the thumb right analog left analog in certain directions there are times where i'm sure it's the same with platformer games where if you're pressing the same exact directions at the same time so many times it will become repetitive so while i was building that i would just replay the same areas to make sure that it didn't feel too repetitive um, i'm sure of course some areas felt a tad bit where like a, you're going to be looking to your left or running forward a few times or to the right. But I wanted to make sure that 
it was different almost every time. And then when it comes to combat spaces, you can pretty much move around everywhere. But this is stuff that's sort of new to me too. And I was just experimenting to see if it felt right. And I don't really play that many uh, Battle Royale game, games now or mm. like Warzone I haven't played in a while or Apex Legends. And um, the gameplay for Rainbow Six Siege is a bit different compared to uh, Apex Legends and Warzone where it's more uh, open world or outdoor and a few indoor. But for Rainbow Six Siege, you know, it's a pretty small space. Once you... Yeah, uh, there are some areas that I wanted to at least give the idea that uh, you have time to just explore around and not really shoot any enemies. But I think that's more of something that a level designer is more responsible of when you even think about like the uh, difficulty, if it's easy, normal, or hard. Uh, you might have a few more enemies or have less ammo. Um, that's stuff I don't really think about on a day basis. And, and like, in, in so, just enlighten me a little bit. Um, so the differences between a concept artist and an environmental artist, oh. are they different or is it the same thing? Oh, no, it's different. Of course, it's, uh, I'm trying to like think that we do. Yeah, 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 we do. Uh, mix of like concept art and level design. And it's just being an environment artist in general, where you want to make sure that it fits the same uh, idea and art direction of the concepts, and it fits with the level design block outs. It's pretty much what environment artists do. Um, but yeah, concept art is literally it's like illustration. Maybe could be painting. I want to say so, but in my case, uh, at least in my past projects, we were just more uh, responsible on the art side of things and less on lighting. Uh, most studios ha already have their own departments with this, for just lighting, like a lighting artist or a lighting department. Um, but I want to say I've seen maybe one or two or a few level designers that have to use lighting as part of their level, like to give. And I do when they'll need lighting for a spotlight for a certain area, but um, when it comes to like literally polishing up the space with good lighting, I'm sure that will have to be handled through yeah. a lighting department or later down. Yeah, the like, yeah, like certain certain companies already have their own like separate department for lighting purposes, um, mm -hmm. and I, I would imagine like. And like um, Activision and Exile, they because they're big companies or big studios, they would have their own departments for that as well. So, yeah, uh, and I will admit I'm probably not the best when it comes to lighting specifically. I probably might have like a good idea when I made the uh, Rainbow Six Siege fan art. Um, I think it was passable or at least good enough with the idea that I had. But when it comes to like lighting specifically, I'm sure nowadays even with UE five. Um, I, probably that's some, for me that's something that I have to look into even more to kind of get a better idea but when I was making the scene I was more focused on the whole scene itself and lighting was like near the end of my process or workflow on that piece but um, as long as it got the point across and I think I only had a few uh, spotlights and uh, point lights but it is kind of interesting seeing how um, for lighting and even for game development in general, it feels like cheating. But if uh, on the back end, when building certain levels or certain scenes, but when you play, you don't really think much about it. Um, 
So for that fan art scene, uh, it was fun. But yeah, I'm trying to think of what else I can say. I think that's, yeah, I'm not really uh, much of a lighter at all. <laughs> the, um, in, in coming up with the designs of the, of the level, for example, um, do they tell you what they want or, or do you guys like concept artists, do you guys sketch down exactly what it should look like before putting it on like digital screen? Like, how do you guys normally do it? My gosh, like the past projects that I worked on, it's like a mixed bag. But as far as like the Talib Jaitl in, in, in general, um, with the uh, concepts that we worked with in the past, or at least for me, that I've worked with, it gives us a good idea with the art direction that they want. And uh, sometimes an environment artist will have some creative freedom to add a few things that they want, but for the most part, it has to stick with first, initially with the concept art and uh, as long as it kind of blends well with the level design uh, yeah. map in general, then it's like a good mix in between. But uh, early in production, I think I have some good examples in my head right now, but I'm just going to relate it to my portfolio pieces where uh, not even just concepts, but even references. Uh, like the Rainbow Six Siege or a few other pieces that I worked on where uh, there's creative freedom to at least have it close to that type of game visually to have that same style or art direction. But yeah, for game development, it usually starts with pre-planning and pre-production, getting the concepts down. And even in during production, when adding more stuff to the game, of course, like more concept, concepts might come in, but uh, just seeing how it works. Sometimes, yeah, I mean, you'll see it in games too, like the games that have been in development in the past and that have come out. And for even GDC talks, you'll see blockouts of even like The Last of Us or a few other AAA titles. Um, and that's like early in the phase of game development on a certain game where, yeah, it's literally just blockouts. But as long as it gets um, the gameplay or the, the style of the gameplay that they want, that it fits with Uncharted or you know, like the Jedi Survivor games, or even like a platforming game, that it feels right, then of course they'll refine it over time, uh, or just yeah, kind of the same idea, and then we'll re replace the blockouts with actual art. Yeah, and um, and you so environmental artists, you guys work in the team of uh, what ten, fifteen, twenty people. Do you guys um get like a set level to work on or do you guys work on all on one level fix up everything and then move to the next thing how does it work like do you guys get like like a thing i know for sure that's different for every studio um but thinking back and this is without me talking about like a certain project um yeah some levels will have like a small handful of artists to work on and well, no, maybe Fortnite might be a good example. You know, it's a, a huge open world area where a few artists can work on one area and a few other area, like a battle royale game. Probably just without even talking about like type of game or the game itself, but um, it's different uh, depending on uh, the game. And I know for sure, like a few small handful of artists will work on like a room, small room. And if it's like a bigger space, of course, it'll have can't really give a good uh, number, but um, just thinking about it again, um, it's even possible, and I'm sure it's happened in the past before too, and has for me, where a few artists will work on a level early in production, and then over time they'll switch over to a different map or a different level, and then a different artist will jump in on that map or level that you worked on a few months ago and then refine it. And not to say that every other artist will jump in in that same map or room, but it'll kind of cycle through where, um, yeah, like just my experience on it, I guess Tony Hawk comes to mind. Um, uh, we'll have a few artists that will just refine or polish certain maps that for me, ones that I worked on near the end, uh, like a few months before the game came out, um, even for like performance or any issues when it comes to like 
game testing or bug fixing or fixing any bugs. Yeah. Um, yeah, that for some reason that was almost like a hassle for me to answer. <laughs> but, <laughs> a good range, a good number. And if you were to include like external studios, that might bump it up too, as far as how many artists are needed for a certain room or a, a project. But um, yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that that at least answers your question. <laughs> yeah, no, you've answered it perfectly. Sorry, guys, you notice uh, that I keep looking to my right. My wife is sleeping on the side, and she's like a lion that roars. That if if I'm too loud, yeah. Oh. So I've got, to, I've got to keep my eyes out. Eh? And I've got another question based on the whole environmental. It's not like subject to like a certain project. Um. So when you guys, because you said that you you guys sometimes you work in a group, sometimes you don't. Um. Like let's say you work in a room or whatever. Um. Do you guys like? um communicate with each other and like once you've like done with the whole process do you guys go through to through like a approval stage show like managers that oh this is what we came up with and then they have to approve it like how does it go with you guys like do you um i don't know the question's a bit thing so um if because you guys work in a group, I'll just reinstate it. So if you work in a group, you have to communicate with your your colleague that oh, we should put this here and put that there, and put this over here. And then once the you guys have finalized what you guys want and done the whole the design of the environment, do you have to go to a manager to, to get like an approval before it goes pushes ahead or anything? It's very similar to what you said. Um even for environment artists or just artists in general to have it be approved from the lead or the level yeah. above, like chain of command. And that's something that I'm more familiar with. Um, there are other projects where it's a bit loose where you can have an opinion about something that kind of falls in more of on the narrative side or writing side or in a different department like level design or even in game testing, which is needed like near the end. Um, but I am so yeah. familiar. With him. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I you got to notice that in the background. <laughs> I was going to say that. Okay. I was going to say. I was going to say this is trading hours, man. Where's the big boss? I haven't seen him come on screen yet. <laughs> but every stream. We have a special, like a, a like a secondary special guest comes in. So we've got the guest, and then we've got a special, like yeah, the cool. undercover boss. <laughs> that's awesome. And, and I'm, I noticed, I noticed Anthony saw like when he walked in, <laughs> he tried to cover up his smile, bro. That was awesome. <laughs> oh man yes <laughs> oh and An anthony's reaction bro as soon as you mentioned tap the screen the tv bro he's like ah. yeah <laughs> Oh, no, no kid. No kid. Um, definitely on the back of my mind. But yeah, definitely on the back of my mind. <laughs> it's a bit of stress. Like, it's not you. Hey, you know how you showed your, uh, like, your fan animation of um the gameplay if you ever decide on making like an indie type of game on your own just like a something like a project like a little small project uh you know who to hit up when it comes to voice acting we've got ink and uh, tarzan on the you know on the ball oh <laughs> definitely yeah if i can do that or if i'm able to i mean yeah it's a totally different route um 
Yeah, if you ever need Aussie actors, hit us up. Oh, of course. <laughs> That'd be fun. I wish I could uh, do that too, like being able to make an actual game. Like just work on, I just work on the art side and. Uh, is that like if you if you work on your own type of like a, like a small little project on your own? Does that like break any like any rules that you work for certain companies? Not like specific to one company, but like does it break like any rules or anything that you can't work on something on your own? I'm sure that's common. Yeah, yeah. Even for depending on the studio, like being able to do freelancing or moonlighting or anything <laughs> outside of work and. Uh, I was able to with, you know, when I was on Bloodline 2 and the company was, uh, back then they were more of an independent company and I think there's some room, uh, had some wiggle room to be able to work on indie games on the side. But after working with, um, well, no, just depending on the studio, yeah, like Activision, it's a bit strict. And of course, now that we're all under Microsoft, but I have no intention of doing my own yeah. game too, so I just like to... The level design stuff was fun for me to do on the side. Uh, nothing for me to get money off of it, but um, yeah, not too long ago, I was like literally an independent contractor and I had some room to uh, do freelance work on the side, but um, kind of drifting off to a similar topic, but it's very common to see developers who have worked under you know a certain company that would eventually like shift into on the indie side to do something that they yeah. wanted to do. Um, I feel like that's common to see. But for my case, like I don't have any games that I've always wanted to make. Um, back then, it, literally like 10 years ago, it was just me wanting to become an environment artist. Um, just to be the game development side, just more on the art. In game development, but just more on the art side compared to like, you know, game testing or something else. But um, I don't know. I, Level design is something that kind of interests me or got interested in not too long ago. Um, but right now I'm satisfied with what's going on. And of course, like for environment art, we work alongside with the design team anyway, or literally just most teams in general too. So as far as like communication, I think to answer your question um, a while ago, uh, yeah, of all the studios that I've worked at in the past, it's very common just to like easily interact with uh, in my case, literally chain of command, but any other departments that we have to work alongside with. Um, of course, for most studios, communication is key, and especially with those working remotely, there's really no other way to stop somebody from messaging somebody and unless, unless there's some, there's a real reason not to, or if there's something that is uh, in the way, but I'd probably answer that yeah. in the wrong way that could easily rub somebody off. But um, if there's a department that you have to interact with, and if somebody's not able to do that, maybe a lead can do that or somebody else can help you, whoever, uh, to do that. But I haven't had any yeah. issues with that. Yeah, I was uh, trying to find did, examples of it. And I continue, sorry about that. Uh, just to kind of quickly or end off what my answer was, um, uh, if it has to go up the chain and if my lead's not available, mm -hmm. uh, Back then, I would reach out to a senior environment artist or a senior um, if I can't do it or if somebody else can do it. It sounds like I need somebody to hold my hand to do that, but uh, I was so used to it back then at the time, the uh, chain of command where I thought it would be insulting, you know, to see a junior or to see somebody a few levels under to reach out to someone high up, unless there's a need to. But uh, I often just tend to myself and do the work, and if there's a need to, interact or communicate to a few levels above, I will do it. Um, and I guess for me at this point, if somebody's not available to do it, I will interact with, you know, manager or supervisor or lead or whoever. Um, just back then I was a little bit hesitant, um, I'm sure, but that's separate from, I think, game development. It is more on this company structure. Yeah. And some are a bit loose uh, and some just kind of prefer to keep it within a certain structure. Like when Michael Bay uh, visited, uh, same with everybody else. Like most of us just wanted to stay quiet and not really uh, cause a scene. And 
I'm sure that's different for other studios where, and you know, if Hideo Kojima or whoever the developer visits the studio, of course there'll have to be folks that have to make sure that nobody will do something that might cause an issue around. But um, yeah, just to reel it back in as far as like communication, I don't think it's that much of an issue. And if there is one, um, I'm sure there's like a department like HR or uh, management in between that can help solve an issue if there's something that gets in the way. And that's literally separate from game development and more of just like team uh, culture, work culture. Yeah. Yeah, man, I, I didn't even know there's so many stuff that goes around in regards to the whole the, the, the building, the whole team building, like there's so many. I didn't even think about that actually. Eh? <clears throat> the reason why I stopped and paused for a bit because like I'm trying my best to word it out in a way that doesn't sound you know offensive. Yeah. Not, no, hundred percent. Like, because issues happen, and yeah, I don't want to like mention studios or anything, but issues can easily happen at a company or within a team, and I I'm probably not the best person to talk about this stuff, you know, how to solve it or how to fix it. But I'm, I, at least for me, the projects that I've worked on in the past kind of am more or were, was focused more on the product itself. Um, I had a few concerns uh, in the past, but uh, nothing to the extent where it would become that serious within mm -hmm. the company, if that makes sense. But I know when I was at the BFX studio, like personalities, some won't really blend or mesh well together, and some do. Um, but I think it takes somebody like a leadership or a figure that kind of gets everybody on the same ground. And it's the same with like uh, office in general or working within a team to make sure it doesn't turn into something else and just make sure everyone's on the same page. Yeah. Um... Actually, I, I I believe I just have one more last question regarding the environmental, um, environmental stuff. Um, when, because I, I believe you might have answered it already, but I might have to try and um, rehash on it. Um, to be able to consider yourself or to be able to get into that position, because I know a lot of people that want to get into gaming, um how long do you have to study for and like how what do you have to do to go to uni and stuff or is it like an opportunity that you can get it's so different now to be honest like um oh you just got to learn coding or something for those that really want to become a programmer or a developer of course that will come into play like a, that's part of game development to have to know how to code um i think it depends on finding the wrong word for it. Maybe it's like going to the gym, like having the will to do all of that stuff and to put up with having to learn you know, scripting languages and going through the whole process. Because when you were to go to, or if you were to go to a uni or university to do that, you're pretty much forcing yourself, you know, physically to attend those classes and to learn. Um, it's pushing you to just learn that stuff and Ah, uh, I'm butchering it. I'm butchering it. I know for sure I'm going to butcher it, but uh, compare that <laughs> to being self-taught because when you're self-taught, you're pretty much pushing yourself to do that compared to going to uni yeah. and uh, knowing that you'll be graded yeah. for what you're doing and you want to have an, an A grade or a passing grade. But at the end of the day, like it's pretty much the person or yourself uh, who wants to really push it to um, not really the limit, but to a level that you want to reach to. Yeah, uh, when I was studying, I I did I did almost or oh, when I was doing it, I was doing um, uh, computer engineering, and they were teaching us how to uh, code for games and stuff, and um, that was that that was probably the only subject that I failed or <laughs> trying to do it. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's when you first do it for the first couple of months, it's actually unless you're like really. Like at that time, my gaming, like me into gaming wasn't like as interested, but then recently, uh, the past three, four years, I've been like really interested and 
coding is not easy. <laughs> oh, not when you start off. I agree. Well, I, I'm more of an artist than I am at all a, a coder. And I think the last time I've done actual coding was like web design, web coding. Um, yeah. Different, totally different. But I think it depends. And if it's not coding, if there's something else in game development that you're into, um, yeah. I think my answer definitely would have been different pre COVID. But now that most studios offer uh, remote work or those being able to work remotely, um, not saying that every studio does that, but it's often now, or it's common now to see that uh, yeah. with studios. And there's really no need to be at a certain location. Uh, I say that with me being here now in Southern California, but uh, for a good reason. And uh, at the same time, with what just happened a few months ago and last year with all of these layoffs, uh, cross my fingers, we'll see more videos form. Um, but nowadays, I think with those in a tight budget, uh, it's oftentimes you'll see folks working remotely or uh, studios being fully remote first. And then maybe at some point they'll have an office like on site. But as far as like learning game development, um, you just really have to push yourself. And it's kind of hard to, for me to explain it in a way that it'll really encourage somebody to do it because it, yeah. you have to, it depends on the field too. Like for me, it was environment art. And so I graduated originally in animation, like 3D art, sure. But I wanted to get into 3D animation and that was competitive enough back then. And being compositing was close for me um, to be able to work on those movies. But I, I transitioned from that to 3D modeling. And then of course that is transferable to just environment art, making 3D assets, uh, kind of the same thing in a way. But um, when it comes to coding, that's a tough one. I'm not the best one to answer that because I don't really code that much, but there's definitely, uh, Gosh, I need to pause my or stop from there, but um, it has to be the person to, to, you know, if you really want to do it. And maybe something as far as like game development will interest you, not just specifically coding, but um, yeah, like for me, just love design, design and environment. I think that's close enough for me. Um, Probably not the best answer, but if someone wants to go to uni to learn game development, sure. But there are probably other factors that I'm missing that I don't really think about or I'm not really thinking about right now. Um, back then, well, I mean, I think it's common now to see internships coming from graduates from certain universities or certain schools. Um, but yeah, that, that's outside of what I'm familiar with. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> not quite self-taught, but once you graduate, even if you were to graduate from a uh, university or a game design school, the industry, you know, changes over time, like trends and workflows and procedures. Game art workflow was different 20 years ago than it was 10 years ago. And yeah, uh, so much has changed. Even when I left um, the VFX industry, I felt like I had to relearn. 3D art again, uh, just the pipeline, uh, adding those assets in Unreal was different back then. And uh, I was learning, or I tried to learn Unreal Engine 3 around 2010, 2011, and I had to relearn it again when UE4 came out. Um, yeah, I'm glad that the uh, UI was uh, much more user friendly, and UE5 is definitely more user friendly, a little easier to navigate around uh, the program. But yeah, back then it was a bit hard for me to do that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers your question. I kind of butchered that and then threw a bunch <laughs> of words around that. No, nah, no, you did good with that. Was... off of my experience because yeah, uh, yeah, I graduated specializing in one small aspect, not just in game development. It was just 3D animation, and then had to. Teach myself and I like joining a community helps too. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Polycount, uh, like an online art game dev community. 
wasn't an active member. Yes, yeah, polycount forum or the polycount forum. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't really much of an active member when I first joined, but slowly started like looking around and posting a few of my work there. Uh, when I left the uh, the effects industry, and definitely helped. So uh, I do have to credit them with me kind of getting back in games and finally becoming a uh, quote unquote environment artist because I want to say without that group or at least that forms, um, I don't know, I probably would have drifted off drift into something else. Um, yeah, I think the caffeine is kind of kicking out, uh, messing my brain right now. I had coffee like two hours ago and it's like 344. <laughs> Yeah, like yeah. I think the sugar just kind of went away, and now I'm like losing all the words that I had. Yeah, no. Based on that, there's not there's not much questions that I have anymore. Um, for you there, you've actually answered everything that I had that I wanted to know about environmental arts. Because as soon as I messaged you, I wanted to know what environmental artist was, like what you guys do. But you've actually answered everything that I've um wanted to know this entire interview. But well, thank you so much for that. Cool, no problem. And yeah, I, I'm sure this is stuff I like talking about, but, uh, but yeah, I guess when it comes to like franchises and IPs and certain games, um, there's only so much I can say. But yeah. as far as like environment art in general um, and game development in general, it's kind of fun to talk about. Uh, yeah. I haven't really talked much about my past in a while. I think that's why I kind of paused because uh, it brings me back thinking about like the small little hurdles that I had to go through. Yeah, the directions I guess I could have gone. Um, didn't really think much about that until yeah. you brought it up. That you know, could have went in a whole different direction. But... The, the the opportunities like opened up for you. Like uh, so when you did mention about the stories, your opportunities widened heaps. I was oh, well, if you're into like game development in general, um, even like indie game stuff, there's a lot more now. Like uh, resources to even look at. All of that, not to say that I, I'm. I guess for me, I'm that type to have to do it myself to prove it. Um, for me, saying it and not doing it, it's hard enough to convince somebody that, you know, of course there are more uh, ways to learn game development nowadays compared to you know years ago. But like, if even if you were to look up like any game showcases and game showcases online, there's so many ways where you can get your game out there and uh, even for discord uh, discord groups and channels uh, uh, yeah like coming from me is probably not i'm probably not the best person to, to say all this stuff but just look up like game development discord groups just to be part of that the penguin group it'll i'm sure push you to want to continue learning or getting into game development and Trying something uh, new as far as like what you're into, but um, yeah, I paused or I stopped again because I I am a part of so many groups that I'm pro probably not as active on. I just kind of frequently check through a couple of those Discord channels, but um, it's still nice to still keep in contact and to frequently post here and there in those groups. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah i think i think um i think that we can wrap it up for this episode um uh this has been really really great unless you had more questions there Inc. Yeah. 
Well, thank you guys for inviting me. And this is stuff that I don't really look back on. Oh, I try not to, but it's kind of interesting just to chat more about it. And you're right, we're all human and neat just seeing it in a different perspective. Um, yeah, it is kind of interesting. It's kind of cool. Actually, before we end this uh, this podcast, because um, you mentioned that you're a gamer, we should we should tee it up three of us in a game or something like like game like play something at least like uh, uh, like Call of Duty or something like that. Oh, I suck. Like, I know I suck on the one. <laughs> yeah. Like Apex Legends or the finals or something, man. We should game something because we all have Xboxes. We can do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 How old? How? That would be awesome, bro. Can you imagine? Can you imagine telling your friends or your your family from family friends? I actually played with the developer of this game. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah let let, let was... me know where your game attack is. Like, I'll message you afterwards, and then and then sure we thing. can see that thing, bro. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I was gonna say, like, I I'm often on YouTube and Twitch of all things oh, during the day. No, I'm not really playing games. Well, sometimes I'll just watch videos on the site or, you know, whatnot while I'm working or. Yeah, you, you know, you know, you know who you, you can watch if you do get the chance to go on YouTube at times? PNX podcast. <laughs> it's so hey, good. It's a good plug. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But um yeah yeah man that's 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 all I had for the day um um uh, after this I'm about to go back to bed again. I'm in the morning. Well, <laughs> uh, probably like ten o'clock or nine over there now. Yeah, it's almost ten actually. Man. Yeah, I don't know how how much sleep I can get uh, now. Maybe and ten fifteen minutes before the lion wakes up. Uh oh. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love it. <laughs> but it, well, I'll, yeah, I'll message you guys my uh, uh, gamer tag. It's kind of generic. Yeah. It's kind of goofy. Yes. Yeah. As soon as you say it, I'm gonna I'm gonna add you straight away, and I'll, I'll pass it to unless you message Inc directly on 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 Twitter. Um. Yeah. I'll, I'll add you straight away, and if if you get the chance, maybe sometime today or whenever you're free, just let me know. And we could tear it up in something at least, like we could play a game or something like that. I'm on board. But anyways, anyways, <laughs> lads, I'm going to go to bed now. I'll see you guys soon.